So we'll be looking at the book of Micah tonight. So this is part 22 of the Heaven Study. So our previous lesson, we did look at the book of Hosea. And as we've looked at these prophets, again, we've seen a lot about the Millennial Kingdom. And there's some kind of blurry imagery in a way. The Millennial Kingdom and Heaven are kind of merged sometimes in the way they're being described. You can see some of the Millennial Kingdom descriptions. It's Sounds great, but it's not quite perfect yet as what heaven will be. And I mentioned last time that it reminds me a lot of our Revelation study and just in the many of the things we've been talking about. So in the previous lesson, Hosea, we saw that God offers mercy, but many forsake his mercy. And heaven, or the millennial kingdom as well, will be a land of peace, prosperity, and righteousness ruled by the Davidic king, which we know is Jesus Christ. God has warned Israel about judgment through special revelation. We see this throughout scripture, and it's even for us today. We're warned about judgment through special revelation of God's word, through his prophets, as the Holy Spirit spoke through men. And we also saw in the book of Hosea, there will be a resurrection and an end to death. I really love that one particular verse we were looking at that echoed from Romans. And you know that death will be destroyed. You know, death, where is your sting? So this was an expectation even of the Jewish people that God would deal with death itself. And we also saw that Israel and the Gentiles would be blessed in the future. So we're seeing a lot of this uh, future new covenant reality that we no, because we're on this side of the cross and that we're blessed by the new covenant. And looking at our definition of heaven, heaven is a spiritual realm where the greatest intensity of God's presence dwells eternally. It is a holy place because God is there. It is where God rules from his throne in the heavenly temple with the resurrected Jesus at his right hand, holy angels and the souls of the redeemed those that have been forgiven by grace through faith live in heaven. Satan currently has access to the heavenly courtroom and accuses the saints daily. One day Satan will be cast out of the heavenly courtroom <coughs> forever. The souls of the redeemed saints will be reunited with resurrected and glorified bodies and will dwell on earth with Jesus for a thousand years. After the millennium, God will create a new universe in earth. Heaven will come down to earth, and the redeemed will live forever with God in a glorified body on the new earth. So if you would turn to me to page 6 tonight, and that title should say the book of Micah. So we're going to look at Micah in particular, and then we'll be getting into Isaiah next week. But on page 6, our first question, what is heaven? And as you look at the opening of Micah, Micah 1 and 2, we see that it is a place where God dwells in his temple. So Michael 1 and 2 says, Hear all you peoples. Listen, O earth and all that is in it. Let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. So we see this warning from God again for an aspect of judgment. But as you read this verse, if you just read it out of context, the Lord from his holy temple sometimes refers to Jerusalem. So the temple's there, and they have the Ark of the Covenant, and the Holy of Holies, God's presence, is dwelling there. But we know from the context of Micah that it's not talking about Jerusalem. It's talking about heaven in particular. So what does it mean that God is in his temple in heaven? Well, God is ruling. This is the king of kings. And as we look in actually the next part, where is heaven? This is the continuation of this. Micah 1, 3 through 4. Where is heaven? As we've talked about before, it's up in the sense of beyond. Again, you can't really fly there, but we see this transcendent reality. But Michael 1, 3 through 4 says, For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place. So there we reference back to the first verse. The Lord from his holy temple, behold, the Lord is coming out of his place. He will come down and tread on the high places of the earth. The mountains will melt under him. And the valleys will split like wax before the fire, like waters poured down a steep place. How do you think Israel would, would uh, react to this? God's coming down there. 
And actually, I don't know if y'all have heard, Dolly Parton has a new song that says, Don't Make Me Come Down There. And it's talking about, like, God looking at things going on in the earth. Like, don't make me come down there. You know, we say that joking, like, in a parent way. Don't make me come over there. Well, you know, here we have scripture. God, as our Heavenly Father, is saying, I'm coming down there. And it's going to be trouble for you. For when he's coming down, he's coming to judge the people. You know, why is he judging the people? But they're not doing what they're supposed to do. They've rejected him. They've worshipped false idols. They are not practicing justice. And we see that theme echoed over and over again in the various prophets as well. In this next question, who goes to heaven? So we've already established as we've looked through the Old Testament thus far that those that go to heaven are those that have faith in God. And ultimately those that have faith in God have a life that reflects him as their Lord, that we are being obedient to him. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And that is something we, we should never forget, is that if we really do love him, we obey him. A follower follows. And just the same, as we look at these descriptions, this is a description of people that go to heaven because they are followers of God, and this is how they should live their lives. So Micah 6, 6 through 8. Who goes to heaven but those who do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly before the Lord? It says, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, ten thousands, uh, ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Now this is a theme that we see echoed even in the New Testament. Is it sacrifice that God wants? What does He want? A heart that loves Him. Yeah, a heart that loves Him, a pure heart, obedient. Those that are, are, do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly before the Lord. Now you see, they already have an understanding of a substitutional death for their sins. Now what did they do on the Day of Atonement? But there was always a sacrifice for the people in general, but people were continually bringing sin off, uh, offerings. And here in the text we see that the person's like, you know, should I bring in burnt offerings? You know, should I bring him a calf? Should I even give him my firstborn for my transgression? Am I going to be forgiven of my sins because I can bring these things to him? And he concludes, you know, no. You know, what does the Lord require of me but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly? And that shows a heart that is oriented to God. But do you see sort of a foreshadowing in this verse? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? A foreshadowing of Christ the only begotten Son, who has been given as a substitute for our sins. <coughs> the next part in who goes to heaven, those whose sins are forgiven. So sins have to be forgiven to be able to be purified, to be able to be in God's presence. And this is from Micah 7, 18 through 20. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity, so that's another word for sin, and in particular, a purposeful sin. Pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He does not retain his anger forever. Because he delights in mercy, he will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob and mercy to Abraham which you have sworn to our fathers from days of old. You know, in all the prophets coming to Israel and they're continually judged for their sins, they continue to remember who God is, that he is merciful. You know, that his anger is not going to last forever. And those who truly turn to him will be saved. He's like, who, who is like a God like you? Pardoning iniquity and passing over all these things that I have done. I mean, should God love us? You know, is there anything really lovable in us that God should forgive us? Or does he do so because he himself is love. He himself is merciful. 
and offers forgiveness to those who will turn to him. Uh, verse 19 actually has a, is a verse that is referenced in a song by Audio Adrenaline. Do you remember what the name of that song is with the casting of the sins? It just left me the title of it. But basically, it's kind of that same idea of, you know, separating the sin, uh, sin from the east to the west, you know, in such a, a way that it's just gone. He says, I will cast all of your sins into the depths of the sea, never to be recovered again. And isn't a great blessing to think that as we turn to Christ and are forgiven of our sins, the sins are never brought back up, are they? They're completely washed away, forgiven and cast away completely. So there was great assurance for those that turned to God because they knew that they would find forgiveness in him, that he was continually merciful. We also see a hint of the remnant of Israel that will return in the end times in this verse. And we'll see more of this as we go through Micah as well. Also, who goes to heaven? So it's those that sins are forgiven. And we've got to remember that salvation is only in the Lord. So this is Micah 7, 5-7. It says, do not trust in a friend. Do not put your confidence in a companion. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your bosom. For son dishonors father. Daughter rises against her mother. Daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own household. Therefore, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. So as we turn to the Lord, wait for the God of my salvation. It is he who saves and only he who saves. And he says, with assurance, my God will hear me as I turn to him. Now, verse 6 is actually quoted in the New Testament. Does anybody know who quotes that? Son dishonors father, daughter rises against her mother. Particularly this daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own household. Anybody know? It's in the Gospels. So Jesus. Jesus quotes that. And he says, you know, I haven't come to, to establish peace. I've come that a, a man's enemies are men of his own household. Now what does he mean by that? Isn't he the prince of peace? And then he says, if you don't love, uh, if you don't hate your mother and father, you can't be part of me. Now what does that mean? Does he literally mean that we're to hate our mother and father? It's just to converse, no matter what. That's right. And you know, it's it, that hate is really a, a lesser love. Yeah. Who's who's the number one person we're supposed to love? It's Jesus. Always Jesus. And here's Israel's got to continue to remember that. For they, you know, we're looking to other countries, looking to their own friends and their family to save them. But ultimately, who was going to save them? Only God. And they had to remember that. And we have to know that as well. That, you know, in the troubles that we go through here in life, who is really going to be our refuge? But it's Jesus. Always Jesus. Who goes to heaven? Another reference is uh, not wicked rulers. So we hear a lot about wickedness in these uh, various prophecies. But Micah 3 and 4 says, Then they will cry to the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time because they have been evil in their deeds. So, you know, the wickedness of Israel had risen to the, the rulers as well. And it's a bad thing when your ruler is wicked, isn't it? Do we know that? <laughs> I, you know, it's just insane the things going on in the world in general of things that are so contrary to God. But the wickedness was coming to these rulers, and they're going to cry out to the Lord, it says in Micah. But is he going to hear them? That's quite a contrast to the verse we just looked at, isn't it? In the one before, Micah 7, Therefore I will look to the Lord, I will wait for the God of my salvation, and my God will hear me. But now to these, it says, They will cry to the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time, because they have been evil in their deeds. Now, what is the one prayer that God wants to hear from the lost? Forgive me. Forgive me. That's right. You know, often when tragedy comes, people cry out to the Lord, even if they have never asked for him to be their savior. 
Now, God has made no promise that he would answer those prayers. And if anything, these kind of things should really worry you because it says that he hides his face from them. He will not hear them. He will not respond to them. He wants people to come to him to humble themselves, to be saved. And as we've talked about throughout this study, heaven is a glorious place because of God's presence. And Israel understood that they were blessed with God's presence. So whenever God's presence was removed from them, trouble was coming, wasn't it? And that's exactly what we see through the history of Israel. So for these that cry out to the Lord and does not hear them without his presence, that is, that is hell. That is what hell is, is God's presence removed from someone. No favor blessing them at all. And to think about that for eternity is just a very frightening thing. A very frightening thing. Going to the next question, what happens when we die? Uh, we leave the earth, Micah 7 and 2. The faithful man has perished from the earth, and there is no one upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. Every man hunts his brother with a net. So again, we're talking about the conditions of going on in Israel. And it says the faithful man has perished from the earth. In other words, bad is what's all around. You know, the good people are gone. But it's interesting how this is phrased, and we see it in some of the other scriptures we've looked at already too, that the faithful man has perished from the earth. Has the faithful man really perished completely? Or does he live on? You know, for eternity. All people actually live for eternity. But the, the faithful man, the one that's a follower of God, is going to live forever in heaven. He's perished from earth for now, but one day he will be resurrected as well. Next question, what will we be like in heaven? It's not really specified in Micah. And what will we do in heaven? Not really specified other than maybe what we're going to talk about in this next part. What is heaven like? Now, if you remember, as we look at these passages, there's sometimes blurry lines between the millennial kingdom and heaven. And we'll see that in this passage as well. This is Micah 4, 1 through 8. So what is heaven like? It's a land of learning and peace. So it says, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days. So what's the latter days? The end. You know, it's probably the millennial kingdom. Uh, when the remnants of the Jews come back. It says, In the latter days of the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow to it. So here we have this image of the Lord ruling the people. And this is Jesus, as we know from the New Testament, as a ruling on earth. And it says the peoples shall flow to it. In other words, the Gentiles, not just the Jews, but the people of the land in general will be coming to Jerusalem. They'll be coming to that direction. It says, many nations shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion, the law shall go forth and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now we see in this verse that they're going there desiring God in this millennial kingdom time. And they're going to be taught his ways. They're going to learn the law and to obey the law. And I, as I got to thinking about this, in the millennial kingdom, it's probably much, much more similar to what we're in now than, than what, we would, um, what we can Im imagine sometimes about eternity or, or God ruling. But people are learning. You know, people are, are growing and maturing. And I've you often heard people say, you know, whenever I get to heaven, I'll be glad to get this answer and that answer. We're always thinking about stuff we want to know. But you know, when we get to heaven, do you think we'll have all knowledge? Or will it be that we get to learn stuff for all eternity? Man, there's a lot of stuff to learn, isn't there? A lot of stuff. How wonderful would it be to look at the saints of old and our, our family members that have gone on before us and the things that they can tell us. I mean, that's just kind of a beautiful picture in itself. Just think, we're not floating on clouds. <laughs> we're with the Lord and we're with the Lord's people and having this reality. And maybe the millennial kingdom just gives us a, a sort of a comfort in heaven of thinking about it's something familiar. You know, that new heaven and new earth as it comes together. As we seek the Lord, as we learn more and more, and we just grow together. And to me, that was just, that's just such a beautiful picture to think about that. We're not going to get bored in heaven. 
forevermore. Our knowledge is available to us. And I mean, we're not, probably not going to meet everybody at one time either. It's going to be a great time. Maybe we can go on vacation in heaven too. <laughs> in verse 3 it says, He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar <coughs> off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Now, what is this describing in the millennial kingdom? Peace. You know, all those weapons of war are done away with. Now, why are they done away with? It's because of the presence of Jesus. And well, let's not forget that scripture tells us he will rule with a rod of iron. So basically, anybody that thinks about doing anything, they're not going to even attempt it at this point. And we know they're a great rebellion to the very, very, very end of the millennial kingdom. But he's going to be ruling a peaceful place. In verse 4, But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. So great blessings because the word is dwelling with them. And this description of sitting under the vine and under the fig tree is a, a description of abundance. And it was a description, I believe, was used to describe Solomon's kingdom as well. Where it's going to be even greater as the Lord rules. In verse 5, For all people walk each in the name of his God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. So these false gods, false worship has gone away. And it says, in that day, says the Lord, I will assemble the lame, I will gather the outcast and those whom I have afflicted. I will make the lame a remnant and the outcast a strong nation. So the Lord will reign over them at Mount Zion from now on, even forever. And you, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come, for the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. So we had this image of, of God gathering in the outcasts, gathering those that have been punished, Israel as well, those that have suffered. He's bringing them in. And you see, as Jesus walked the earth, as he was healing the lame, as he was really with the outcasts, he was giving people a taste of the kingdom to come, wasn't he? It's like, it has arrived. The kingdom of God is emerging upon the scene. And such a beautiful picture for the future of dwelling with Jesus as our, our Lord, as our leader, as the king of the kings of earth. And the next part, what is heaven like? Well, enemies with their violence and false worship will be gone. We saw that actually in this last chapter too. But Micah 5, 2 through 15. It says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me, the one to be ruler in Israel who's going forth are from of old, from everlasting. What is that talking about? Jesus. Jesus. You know, we've talked a lot already about that the Lord is ruling uh, the, the people, then this millennial kingdom, and then really in heaven as well. And here we have a prophecy stuck right in the middle of Micah. You in Bethlehem. And if you remember when the wise men came to Jerusalem searching for the, the he who was born king of the Jews. The scribes looked, and what did they say? They quoted Micah. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. So that's where Jesus was born at. And isn't it amazing to see God's hand in every bit of that too? Because why was he in Bethlehem to be born? The census. Yeah, the census. So it was an unusual situation that brought him and fulfilled this prophecy. But look how he describes them. Yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. So this is the one they've been looking forward to that's going to be ruling this millennial kingdom. The one that's going to be ruling the new heaven and new earth. Whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Now how could that be? How could it be that one who's to be born in the future is going to be his going forth or from old, from everlasting? He's there at the beginning, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It is God Himself. And you know, you, we see this in the, the lens of the New Testament, and we understand better than the Jewish people understood, but their own scriptures already was revealing this truth to them. This ruler is God. Going on to verse 3. Therefore... 
He shall give them up until the time that she who is in labor has given birth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel. Now that verse is actually talking about the church period. What we're in now for the Gentiles. He's going to give up Israel for a time being until the time that she is who in labor has given birth. There's an imagery we see even in Revelation of the Jewish people. And the remnant of the brethren shall return to the children of Israel. So as the ruler comes, he's going to have the Gentiles and Israel together. Going on to verse 4. And he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall abide, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. Now we have this imagery of the good shepherd. He's feeding his flock. And he's doing this in the strength of the Lord. And it's going to be to the ends of the earth. Verse 5. And this one shall be peace. He is the prince of peace. And when the Assyrian comes into our land, and when he treads in our palaces, then we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight princely men. So this is, uh, again, using imagery of enemies of Israel as they were experienced. You remember Assyria came and destroyed Israel, and then Babylon came and destroyed Judah later on. And then, you know, the Romans later on and are even called Babylonians. And well, here we've got this image of the enemies of the end time. They're the Assyrians. And he says that they will raise against him seven shepherds and eight princely men. Now, this is what you call an, an idiom. You ever hear someone say it's raining cats and dogs? Do you expect to walk outside and see cats and dogs falling from the sky? That'd be funny. That would be funny. It'd be kind of scary, honestly. <laughs> Well, this seven shepherds and eight princely men is just saying this is just sufficient enough leaders, more than enough to, to rule what's going on and keep things under control. And in the millennial kingdom, you know, we will rule in some sense. And, you know, I don't know the, all the, the ins and outs of that, and I don't think Scripture is completely um, telling of everything with it, but certainly Jesus will have us serving him in some sense. And there will be leaders even in that millennial kingdom. Going on in verse 6. They shall waste with the sword the land of Assyria and the land of Nimrod at its entrances. Thus he shall deliver us from the Assyrian when he comes into our land and when he treads within our borders. So you see this also is a little bit of that description of the millennial kingdom that doesn't quite sound perfect, does it? It doesn't quite sound like heaven because there's war. There's some sense of battle. And this may be describing when Jesus returns the first time to set up the millennial kingdom. He's, you know, destroying those enemies then. And we know there's a great rebellion at the end as well. I feel like we're just doing like a re-summary of Revelation over and over again as we look through this. And going on verse 7, it says, In the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many peoples, like dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass, that tarry for no man, nor wait for the sons of men. Now, Israel that keeps being judged, there's going to be this remnant, and it's describing them like dew from the Lord. It's a blessing, and there are going to be so many among the people. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles, in the midst of many peoples, like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion among flocks of sheep, who, if he passes uh, through, both treads down and tears in pieces, and none can deliver. So it's just talking about the power of Israel with, with the Lord. Your hand shall be lifted against your adversaries, and all your enemies shall be cut off. Now, this is a picture that Israel was always looking towards with the promised land. As God is going to suppress and deal with his enemies, as we look at the millennial kingdom, he's going to suppress and deal with the enemies. And as we look at the end of the new heaven and new earth, what happens to our enemies? They're suppressed and they're dealt with. And that last enemy to be destroyed is death. In verse 10, and it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that I will cut off your horses from your midst and destroy your chariots. I will cut off the cities of your land and throw down all your strongholds. I will cut off sorceries from your hand and you shall have no soothsayers. Your carved images I will also cut off and your sacred pillars from your midst. You shall no more worship the work of your hands. I will pluck your wooden images from your midst. Thus I will destroy your cities. And I will execute vengeance and anger and fury on the nations that have not heard. So as the Lord returns, sets up his millennial kingdom, all false worship is absolutely dealt with, done away with, destroyed. Now, it's really kind of hard to fathom the amount of false worship there is in the world 
even now. You know, we don't live in this, well, <laughs> I say we don't live in this pagan world like the Roman time, the first century, but really we do. We do. Uh, but, you know, just all over the world, there's still all this false worship. And people may have idols they don't think are their idols. I think the biggest idol for people today is their selves. People worship themselves. What I want to do is what I, what's, I'm going to worship. Isn't that really just the, the root of sin in general? It's just this prideful worship of self and rejecting of God. But all those things are going to be dealt with. The Millennial Kingdom will be a time of peace. And heaven itself will be a, a time of absolute peace forevermore for us, as all these false worships are done away with. How can we know anything about heaven? Well, just like the others, we look through special revelation through the prophets. I just referenced Michael 1 and 1. And then the last question, <coughs> did Jews always believe in heaven, afterlife, or the resurrection? So this is just kind of some summary questions we look at at the end. Well, again, we see that God's presence is needed for protection. That's just such an important thing that we don't need to forget. Israel realized that. If they didn't have God, they were in trouble. If we don't have God when we die, <coughs> we're in trouble, aren't we? This is Micah 3, 11 through 12. Her heads judge for a bribe, her priests teach for pay, and her prophets divine for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? No harm can come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed like a field. Jerusalem shall become heaps of ruins and the mountains of the temple like the bare hills of the forest. Now you see these, the judge, the priests, and the prophets in the land. Now what were they supposed to be doing? But serving God, leading the people. But you got the judge that's operating for a bribe. Priests are teaching for pay, for gain. And you know... That's really scary to think about uh, some of these just multimillionaire pastors today that take advantage. It's just, uh, that kind of stuff just drives me crazy. But if you look back, it's nothing new, is it? People taking advantage of other people. And then in her prophets, divine for money. Yes, money is, a, the love of money is a root of all evil, isn't it? People keep wanting to do things to make money. It's the prophets, the priests, and the judges. And what do they think? Is not the Lord among us? No harm can come upon us. Man, isn't that just the attitude of so many people? They think, well, I can just do what I do, you know. <laughs> I'm good. Maybe I, I got my name on the registry at church, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm good with the Lord. Yet yeah, you're doing, living a life that's obviously contrary to the Lord. What does God say? He says, therefore, because of you, Zion's going to be destroyed, Jerusalem's, heaps of ruins, and mountains of the temple lay bare. So, they think they're okay because of God's presence with them. But he's going to remove his presence from them and destruction is going to come upon the people. So again, let's never forget the importance of God's presence is needed for protection. They knew that, but they wrongfully thought they were okay with the Lord and they were dealt with. And then the next part, so uh, what did the Jews believe about this future is a faithful remnant of Israel will return to God in the future. I think, um, I think all of the um, prophets we've looked at thus far have this imagery in it, that a faithful remnant of Israel will return. This is Micah 2, 12, uh, see, yeah, Micah 2, 12 through 13. It says, I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like sheep of the fold, like a flock in the midst of their pasture, they shall make a loud noise because of so many people. So even though Israel and Judah is being destroyed, God is always keeping a faithful remnant throughout history and even today. And then in the end, there will be a great incoming of Jewish people that realize and acknowledge the Messiah and accept him. It's going to be a great number of people, he says. And verse 13, the one who breaks open will come up before them. They will break out, pass through the gate and go out by it. Their king will pass before them with the Lord at their head. So it's just blessing of the future, and they understand a remnant's going to be returned. So God never abandoned Israel. Never did. And then the next part is Micah 7, 8 through 10. It says, Do not rejoice over me, my enemy, when I fall. I will arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. So, you know, they've just, again, got this hope of the remnant. And... 
you can think about how discouraging it probably was for the people that were faithful to God. And all around them, everything is corrupt. Israel just constantly opposed to God, not following him. And now they're going to suffer because of the foolishness of the people around them, of the culture around us. Is that what we live in today? It is. I can't tell you how many times I just read things in the news and it's just, it pains me very much to think that people have this, just such a sinful look at life and they think they're okay. And it's just terrible what people are doing to each other. And you know what? We live in the middle of that and it's going to come down upon the head of our country, the head of our world as we continue to go away from God. But here is what we can say as well as he's faithful. He says, don't rejoice over me, my enemy. When I fall, I will arise. I'm going to be okay. When I sit in darkness, the Lord be a light to me. So Israel as a whole is thinking of this as a nation. They're coming back. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him. So Israel as a, a people realized they had been opposed to him as a whole. Until he pleads my case and executes justice for me. He will bring me forth to the light. I will see his righteousness. Then she who is my enemy will see, and shame will cover her who said to me, Where is the Lord your God? My eyes will see her. Now she will be trampled down like mud in the streets. There's complete victory over enemies. And you see, Israel, even in their foolish, <coughs> foolishness, when they were punished, realized there was still hope in God. And let us remember that. For if we fall short, and we all do in various ways, and the Lord punishes us for our sins in some way, let us remember that the Lord is merciful, and that he's always there, that he's all, there's always hope in God. And as we see these enemies destroyed and, and dealt with with Israel, let us remember there's complete victory in Jesus. How does the hymn go? go? Victory in Jesus. And that is something we should say amen and amen to. Because, you know, we're in a battle. And it continues on. And that battle's not just physical, it's a spiritual battle as well. But we have complete victory. Because of God's presence. Who dwells within us. Who has sealed us for the day of redemption. And that we are as good as glorified already. Because of what God has done through Jesus Christ. So there's great hope. So God's work in Micah. As we see, heaven is for those who do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly before the Lord. These are the same people that their sins are forgiven and that know that salvation is only in the Lord. And we see that Israel remembers God's presence is needed for their protection, for their victory. And their enemies will be gone in heaven. Their enemies will be gone in that millennial kingdom as well that we dealt with. And a faithful remnant of Israel will return to God in the future. So this is their looking forward in hope. And the Messiah will rule Israel. And he will be God. As Micah has said, he's the one who is uh, from everlasting. The one, Jesus Christ, who we know today. Anybody got anything to add? Or Micah's an interesting book. Really, as you get into the prophets and look through these perspectives of the millennial kingdom or, or heaven and eternity in general you just see so much that we really can rest in in the Lord but as we get into Isaiah we're going to see a lot more prophecy looking forward to the Messiah and um, just lots of great hope um, in one of Natalie's classes she was actually learning a thing about Isaiah do you remember how it was they said the books were broken up it, and this is not really completely accurate because the books were made, chapters were made later on. But if you look at the way the chapters are set up, it's like the Old Testament in Isaiah and then the last half of it is the New Testament in Isaiah with, with Jesus. So it's kind of just this, the scripture in general all put together right there in the book of Isaiah. Anything else? All right. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for the great hope that we do have in you. And help us to take note of Israel's uh, reactions to your warnings, to their failures as well. And to understand, Lord, that we do not have to go their path. Uh, we do not have to be the fool. Help us to just 
be very wise in all the things that we choose to do as we seek you, that we would respond to your word, that we would adjust our lives to what you are commanding us. And I do thank you for the great hope that we have in you, Lord, that all of our enemies will be defeated, all of your enemies, and that last enemy to be destroyed is death. And I thank you that even when we sit in the midst of a sinful people, of a situations that just seem almost hopeless, Lord. We know that there is always hope in you, that in the darkness there is always light shining through. And help us, Lord, to be faithful in telling others that good news as well. People are searching for hope, and help us to tell them that hope is in Jesus Christ. Help us to rest in you and to find great comfort in your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.